Um, so uh, I'll open it up for questions, but first I wanted to ask um, a question that I think um, you know, all of us when we were discussing this panel wanted to know about each other, uh, and that is um, what are some of the lessons learned um, that, that you can share, uh, something that you wish you knew when you started out? Just go down the table. I probably would have better prepared our governance, our board, for this um, transformative journey that we've been on, mm. rather than doing it first and then going back and apologizing. <laughs> Which also works. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> I'd say, so we ended up flipping the traditional product development process. So we ended up having this concept of videos and then went out and talked to institutions and publishers and associations. And we're, we're still proving that out, but I think that uh, we probably should have invested up front in a lot more uh, discussions with institutions and these other stakeholders to get a sense of what their needs are. Because we've, in our conversations, found that many are looking for a full service solution. Many are looking for something that's, that's more expensive rather than less expensive. So I, anybody that's going down this process, customer feedback early and often, I think, is key. Uh, and the, um, uh, so, uh, the example that I shared during the presentation, uh, the, we had the executive commitment on it with that um, particular group, but didn't have the dedicated community manager. So it really is just, you know, it's been said a couple times, just super important uh, for the success. And I would say, uh, make your own luck. <laughs> Don't eliminate your dependencies wherever you can. Are there any questions? Please. Um, so I'm Christine Charlotte from American Society for Microbiology. And I was interested in what Susan had to say about uh, the fact that many of the people who had some part of their world it revolved around plant biology, but had no really relationship or didn't think of themselves as a plant biologist necessarily and weren't engaged. So same thing with microbiology, where there's a, a lot of people, engineers, chemists, that, that work with microbes, but they would never think of themselves as microbiologists. So I was wondering, in engaging those people, how did you, how did you try to reach out? Because somebody said, if you build it, don't expect them to come. But, so how do you have something there for them, but let them know about it? Right. So um, as part of the market research and um, analysis we did with Bear Analytics. Part of it was looking at who, exist, who was, existed in our world, and the other part was looking at opportunity for growth, both strategically through partnering with other organizations, such as yourselves, we have to talk, um, uh, but also um, you know, where geographically and topically um, are the most likely audiences that we would reach out to, and then we rated them. So when we turn on the big marketing machine, which is not on right now, um, we will um, methodically go uh, into reaching out to these individuals. And that is all part of a content, um, uh, essentially a content marketing strategy uh, focused on different channels. And depending on the groups, we'll have to do our due diligence and figure out what channels we're going to go through. But again, the best way to do it, honestly, is to partner with other organizations and make it a, mut a mutually beneficial scenario and do it that way. That's why strategically uh, Plant A is much bigger than ASPB. Are there any other questions? Was there another? <laughs> okay, well, um, another, please. I have a question. Uh, Darrell Gunter, SDM. In regards to early days metrics, what type of metrics do you uh, hold on to to say, yes, we're moving in the right direction? What are some of the, the low-hanging fruit metrics that you think will show you early success? For us, we look at uh, number of users, user growth, um, weekly and monthly login, and weekly and monthly engagement. So we're looking at that collaborator who is actually going beyond contributing something and actually uh, seeking somebody else out within the platform. So once that's happened, we know that there's, there's a flywheel effect. Our goal is about increasing researcher visibility. So we're looking at all metric scores, uh, views on YouTube and Vimeo, article views, downloads, all this, the uh, key usage stats that a, a publisher would track. 
In terms of measurable metrics, uh, ours are very similar to uh, uh, Josh's, uh, but on top of that, we're very interested in the uptake of um, individuals coming to us and saying, hey, I have this group or I have this organization, can we set up, uh, you know, can we work with you in Plante? And we've started to see that increase as well, so that's huge for us. There's a question over there. Hi, I have a couple questions for you, Derek. Uh, the Wiley deal is exciting. I'm curious if authors or researchers who are taking advantage of the option to purchase video are also paying that $1,500 price you quoted per video through Wiley. They will be. So with Wiley, it's the partnership is a, it's a mechanism to provide these videos to authors. But we've also worked with MRS and other partners who are paying. And that's our ultimate goal is to have these be provided to researchers who have the funds to pay, but also if a great piece of research is coming through for a journal editor to be able to purchase that on behalf of the author so that it can get the, the publicity it deserves. Okay, wonderful, thank you. I'm also curious if Research Square is developing any other services. I know you said you had 200 people. Are most of those people working on video development or do you have other services in the works you're hoping to provide? We, we always have services in the works. Um, we are have a sort of think tank division. We actually just brought on um, Damian Pattinson from PLOS, and so he's exploring where we go with Rubrik, which um, initially was a peer review solution, and I think it's, it's still gonna go in that vein, but he's looking at things like uh, preprint, other ways that we can support um, researchers and journals in that production phase, so I think that's probably the next thing you would hear from us. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, here you go. Hi, it's uh, Michael Forster with IEEE. Um, uh, because of um, my, my uh, recent professional experience, I can't resist making a, a sort of terminology observation around the use of the phrase content marketing. Um, so I, I hope you all accept this um, observation in the spirit it's intended. Um, content marketing in the world outside of our realm is universally understood to mean something different than I think we're using it here. Um, so in the marketing profession specifically, it, it means only uh, the use of content as a marketing tool. Um, I don't know if this is resonating with the, I can see some nodding uh, up at the front there, but um, I'd encourage people to look at the Content Marketing Institute, for example, and, and maybe think about using our terminology in a nuanced way, perhaps as uh, marketing of content or something similar. But there's room for confusion here, and I, I, as I, said, I, I couldn't resist making the observation. Yeah, that's I will Thank say you. I had a slide in my presentation that was, what is content marketing? that I ended up cutting okay. out because it was, um, I was trying to keep it to 10 minutes. But I think that, I think you're exactly right. And I think that um, it's not just marketing of content, but some of the things we're trying to borrow, borrow from content marketing is the uh, best practice is usually to take something like a white paper and use it to create blog posts and then piece that apart so you have tweets or Facebook posts. So it's really leveraging that, that content to, to get maximum value. And that's the approach we've tried to take with the videos where you have the video that's like the initial white paper, but it can also be pieced apart to really create a wealth of content to use in different ways. And in, in the digital world, content is basically like currency. You have to, it's how people engage. You cannot market digitally without a val without content. Um, it's just how it works, and um, it's extremely important. And with Plante, um, we feel like content is what initially engages people, but then it's the experience and then sort of the marketplace piece that powers it behind it. You and then David also had a question, so okay. please uh, go ahead. David Nygren from Wiley. Um, question for Susan and Josh. I'm wondering um, if you're hoping to pull users away from pre-existing scientific collaboration networks, um, and if so, how? Or do you see your platforms as complementary? Our initial strategy, um, we knew, we're small, we knew that we couldn't compete with the LinkedIn's and the research gates of the world. That's not what we're here to do. Um, strategically, we want to be uh, uh, complementary. There is always going to be, let's put it this way, information is abundance and attention is scarce. We all know that, okay? What 
our fo focus really is to create that one place that is all plant science all day long. Um, we know that people are going to choose to participate in other networks for a variety of reasons, um, but we are trying to be as complementary as possible in our approach. And I think, you know, similar to what Susan said, we, we talked to a lot of people about what they liked and disliked about existing platforms out there. I think there's a, there's a lot of concern about, you know, the LinkedIn's and the Facebook's. People were definitely looking for something that is more, more pure science professional. You know, with the other with the other networks um, you mentioned, it's unclear how much it is. That we we term them scholarly collaboration networks. It's not clear to me that collaboration is really much of what's going on there. So I think that there's a place for this. A lot of what we hear in a lot of the groups we're talking to, they would choose to work with us versus cobbling together Google Docs or Dropbox or uh, or you know borrowing that SharePoint site until that person leaves the committee. Karen, did you want to add something? Um, sorry, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, David. Um, so Susan, you mentioned um, a direct revenue stream through membership for Plante, and um, I also heard, um, you know, perhaps these collaboration networks would drive indirect revenues. But do you envision any of you um, commercialization or commercial support, either through advertising or single sponsorship of? sites or is that just a no-go for most of these um, community engagement collaboration you know, networks? It's not our, it's not our intention, I prefer. It, it, I think it's hard with these networks to think, when you look at, when you look at the world of advertising and ad buying now, may, maybe sponsorships, but in terms of pure advertising, I believe that we can get reasonable numbers of intensive usage but it's hard to get to the scale that you need to support things purely with advertising these days. We are set up to um, have some sponsorship, trying to do it as a non-invasive, um, you know, not cluttering um, up the screen. I know people kind of stuff pops up and it gets uh, in the way. So it's there as a possibility and it's really dependent on the person or the group that whether they want to be using that as a, as a revenue source. Our, our monetization uh, strategy is really all around the marketplace concept, where it's either through premium membership or ad hoc purchases um, of, for access uh, to products, programs, or services. Anyone else? So um, a question I wanted to ask is um, just looking ahead. Um, each of your products is at relatively exciting new um, stage. So what are, the, what are the questions that you're facing now? What are the, um, as you kind of look forward towards the next steps? It's the, for the entire panel. Well, you know, I mean, we don't know what we don't know, and I keep saying that, but technology disruptors, you know, something major could come along, we can have this huge aha moment, and the game can completely change, and that's just the reality of our world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, again, back to, uh, just really focusing on the engagement piece and creating a really vibrant community, no matter what tool you're using, is the most important thing. Uh, but that, I would say, it's, it's really the disruptive things and, and the millennial workforce um, also coming into play. For Research Square, I, I think that there's been a lot of discussion about the decoupled journal, and I think that there's tremendous benefits there in terms of researcher choice and enabling a researcher to go and get just the services they need. But I think long term, what we're facing is what, what does recoupling look like? I think in the end, if everything is decoupled, there's a lot of friction in the process. So our big focus right now is how you tie everything together. Um, and I'll say that I think in the future, societies are perfectly positioned to provide that recoupling because they have not just the, the publisher side, but also the member support side. So they're in a, a great position to live in that, that triangle I, I kept referring to where they're really collaborating and providing a seamless process where the, the researcher can get exactly what they need throughout publication. For us, uh, it's trying to make sure that uh, we're not perceived as a, yet another place somebody has to go. So our challenge is always to try and make sure that we're finding a place of integration and being additive, supplement, um, you know, adding value rather than, um, you know, again, Susan touched on it, there's just uh, so much information and less attention, so trying to rise above that. 
and for us it's really the focus on, on engagement. The tool, you have to have the underlying platform, but then ensuring that, that you're really getting the users engaged either directly through, through the way the tools are, are, are built and utilized, but as importantly in, in really ensuring that there are people stewarding these communities. Thank you. Well, I think if um, there, are there any other questions? I think otherwise this is a, an excellent uh, point to end on. Yes, please. The magic wand question. <laughs> if you could wave your magic wand, what is the one thing you would like for your service to be able to achieve this year? Mm. Ubiquity. <laughs> <laughs> Set a magic wand. <laughs> right. I mean, I guess for us, it's it is that elusive ROI, and and Josh, you touched on it too. Is that we we believe it's there. We just have to prove it out um, through through use and and uh, creating those metrics. I'd say validation. I think we'd love to see at the end of the year if videos were an accepted form, um, an ancillary product of the, the publication process, whether it's produced by Research Square or someone else. I think that is um, it's a big win for, for the video abstracts. I would say uh, a significant increase in engagement and uh, community members actively contributing to the growth of the community. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's give another round of applause to our panelists.